Hey channel, welcome back and welcome to 2024, January 1st, 2024. This is going to be an exciting year. I want to say a quick shout out to uh, my daughter. It's her birthday today. She was born on January 1st, New Year's baby. I missed a tax dedu deduction by that much. Anyway, happy birthday, Megan. I love you. Okay, today, guys, you're in for a treat. I'm going to go through my 2023 Honda Wing DCT and do a one-year ownership review of this bike. I've ridden it for a year now, got it a year ago, and I'm going to walk through the good, the bad, and the ugly. I've made a little list because Lord knows I can turn a 20-minute video into a 50-minute video without any problem whatsoever. So we're going to try to stay on task today and get you in and out of here quick. If you are in the market for a touring motorcycle or you've been head dry on a Honda Go Wing, this video is going to be for you. They changed the body style in 2018, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about today applies to the 2018 year model and higher, uh, including the 2024 models, which have just come out. Very little change between my 23 and the new 23 models. Basically just some paint, I believe, is the only change. So this will apply too. So if you've got your eye on this bike, stay tuned. You're going to learn something. Let's start with the looks of this bike. Oh my gosh, in 2018, they redid the body and body style and basically put the Goldwing on the Atkins diet, trimmed a lot of space, which includes some storage space, so there's a little bit of gripes about that, but they made this thing sleek. I never really was in the market for a Goldwing. They were just way too big and bulky for me. I'm a small guy, never thought I would be in the market for one until I saw this one and it looked like a sport touring bike. I'm telling you, wow. For 20 years, I rode a Honda VTX 1800 that I loved dearly. I saw this on the showroom floor and I said, it's time to trade it in. So anyway, beautiful styling. Let's just take a quick walk around here. Aerodynamic. Love this color, this is ardent red. It's a three-tone if you pay attention. Two-tone primarily, but it's got the ardent red on the bottom, uh, a more of a Merlot red on the top, and then separated between the two, it's got this pinstripe pretty much around the bike that is a darker maroon. So it's really a three-tone bike. Really love the paint on this bike. Now, let's talk about the key fob. Very cool. This key fob has to be very close to this bike for anything to work. For the bike to turn on, for the saddlebags and the trunk to unlock, for the gas cap release button to unlock, for the bike to turn on, this little gadget controls so much. Don't lose this. Next, let's talk about the sound of this bike. <laughs> First time I turned this thing on, oh my gosh. Doesn't sound like a Harley, sounds like a jet engine, sounds like a Porsche. Take a listen. It just purrs. Higher revs, this engine has higher revs than my VTX did. My VTX really was a low rev engine and had that traditional V-twin sort of looping rumble to it. This thing, wow. All right guys, let's start up front here with these wheels, cast aluminum wheels. You know, my VTX had spoke wheels and that meant it had tube tires, which was really kind of a pain. You'd have to carry the tubes around your saddlebags because tubes are hard to find. You have a flat tire on the road and you don't have tubes in your saddlebag, it's gonna be a while before you get that tire fixed. Not an issue with these. Cast aluminum wheels and um, these tires, the front tire is a 130 by 70 uh, 18 inch tire. The rear tire is a 200 by 55 16 inch tire. Love these wheels. You can see that I've, uh, in, I've added some uh, burgundy pinstriping to match the color of the bike. Love that, it was a great addition. Front disc brakes here. The front ones are controlled by two 320 millimeter rotors, 
electronically controlled ABS. The rear tire has one rotor, a 316 millimeter rotor. When you apply the brake, whether it's the pedal brake or the hand brake, it gives a little bit of brake to both wheels. Um, depending on which one you use, allocates it a little differently, but it, both wheels get some braking power. I thought that was pretty unique with this bike. All right, gonna work our way from the front of this bike to the back of this bike. First, the headlights. I love this configuration on these headlights. Multiple beam, multiple sectioned headlights, just look super cool along with these daytime running lights that sort of run beneath them just way cool plenty bright both on the bright setting and the regular setting illuminate your path at night so well and also very visible for oncoming traffic let's talk about this front fork it is not a traditional motorcycle double shock uh, fork it is a single shock double wishbone design with a 30 degree rake. Uh, the single, the double wishbone, let me see if I can get you in here where you can see it. Okay, there you go. You can see the double wishbone design. Uh, you got two uh, steering rods here that help steer it and then a single shock in the middle and it has more of a vertical up and down sort of travel to it rather than uh, a traditional set of forks. How different is it? Yes, it feels different. Is it significantly different? I don't think so. You know, you still feel the bumps. It's just like I said, this travel is more up and down than it is sort of angular on, on what's on, on a normal bike. All right, let me get up in here and see if you can see this. There you go. Some excellent engineering. It allows this wheel to get closer to the engine provide better stability overall for the bike. Double wishbone suspension, very cool. Okay, next let's talk about these side mirrors. Both sides um, have daytime running lights, integrated turn signals, very visible from the front. Big amber in, uh, lights in the front, very nice. They also fold like that. If you need to get your bike in a tight spot, they fold in and then fold right back out. Beautifully styled to go with the bike. Manually adjustable on the back side. I've added sort of an aftermarket blind spot mirror to it so I can see better in my blind spots, but otherwise, functionally, they work really well. And then down here, the fog lights. You know, on the 2018 models, the first uh, year model that they redesigned the bike, I don't believe the fog lights came standard with the bike. Later uh, in year models, I think 2021 maybe, they included these fog lights now as standard equipment on the bikes. And they're absolutely functional. They light up the road very well. Uh, there's an on-off button uh, switch up uh, on the center control panel there and uh, really like them. Uh, glad they come with a bike standard now. I've also added these cow lights uh, on the side. You can see here aftermarket cow lights and integrated turn signals. Let me show you how that looks. Okay, there you can see the integrated turn signal. I have uh, the right turn signal on. Just really cool, very bright. Light up the ground around the bike as you're traveling at night. Puts a great halo of light around the bike, increased safety. And again, those are aftermarket cow lights. All right, let's talk about that engine. 1,833 cc's, horizontally opposed engine, providing 125 foot-pounds of torque and 125 horsepower. Smooth, just buttery smooth engine low to the ground, which contributes to the stability of this bike. Liquid cooled, 73 millimeter bore and stroke. Just love this machine. This bike is so smooth. Uh, there's almost no vibration when it's on. You can hardly feel any vibration in the handlebars, which is great for long distance riding. It revs higher than my VTX did. Uh, just naturally, that was a little bit of an adjustment for, you, for me, but 
that contributes to the smoothness. It has four different modes of, of drivetrain. It has econ mode, which saves gas. It has rain mode, which dumbs down the throttle a little bit and protects you uh, during, in, in wet surfaces during the rain. It also has tour mode, which is the normal riding mode for me. I ride in tour mode most of the time. And then it has sport mode. Oh my gosh, turns this thing into a rocket, a sport bike almost. I, it will get up and pull away from you, out from under you. It is so fast in sport mode. Sport mode tends to be uh, pretty jerky, so I don't keep it in sport mode a lot. I normally ride in the tour mode. That's the one that has the smoothest transition and is just uh, best for day-to-day -day riding. Now, there is a vulnerability to this engine, and you know, Honda, really? Um, let me tell you, down below, there's no protection on this engine. If you run over something on the road and it kicks up the bottom of this engine, there are parts down here that will break off and spill every bit of oil out of your engine instantly, and now you have a $11,000, $12,000 engine replacement on your hands. So the first thing I bought was this Traction Dynamics belly pan to protect the bottom of this engine from just such an occurrence. Uh, insurance, very well worth it. Get yourself a belly pan. If you buy one of these bikes, protect this. Otherwise you're looking at potentially an eleven dollars or $12,000 engine replacement. It ought to be the first thing you buy. It was the first thing I bought. Next, let's talk about these uh, tip-over guards that the bike comes with from the factory. Just got some plastic covers on them and they're metal bars underneath. They're just not big enough. Uh, in a very slow tip-over, like the bike's starting to tip over and you try to hold it but can't and you're sort of helping it to the ground, it will stop on these bump stops and, and probably not damage the bike. But if it tips over on its own, it's gonna flip right past these bump stops. You got one there. And you got one back here on the exhaust pipe. It's gonna tip right over. And then you're into damaging your side mirrors here. You're into damaging your saddlebags, which is an expensive repair. So yeah, I'm looking at the uh, Traction Dynamics tip over protection that Max has put together for the bike. Uh, again, insurance, good to have. All right, let's talk about this windshield for a minute. This is the first electronically adjustable windshield I've ever had on a bike, and it is fantastic. The windshield that comes with the bike is a 20 inch windshield. You can buy aftermarket windshields that are shorter than that or taller than that, 24 inch, I think. I like the 20 inch, but when I say it's electronically adjustable, watch the travel on this thing. All right, I've got it in the lowest position here. Let's watch it. Look at that, raised to the highest position. That's gotta be seven or eight inches of travel. In the highest position, I'm looking through the windshield. Well, I don't care to look through the windshield much, but on the freeway, when I need some extra wind protection, the ability to raise that up is really helpful and it does block a good bit of the wind in the raised position. Now, let's bring it down again. And there it is in the lowest position. And that's the way I typically ride it. I'm looking over the windshield at this point. Really a love this adjustable windshield. There's also at the top of this dash uh, a little wind deflector that pops up. If you're you know, in the summer and it's really hot riding, the air that comes up underneath this windshield gets caught by this thing and pushed more directly back to you. Uh, just a you know, poor man's air conditioner, if you will. Uh, I've had it up. A time or two I'll be honest with you I can't really tell a lot of difference but it's a unique concept and I'm sure it is blowing some air you know on me and just snaps back down into place now speaking of deflecting air I have added these aftermarket uh, wind lower wind deflectors air deflectors on my bike I really like the design of this they're from Panicle I believe that's a Chinese company um, and I did have the upper uh, wind deflectors underneath the mirrors here, but uh, it turns out those were not such great quality and it was hard to keep them you know, steady. 
but these seem to be better quality. They bolt right into the cowl here and they have an adjustable pane that is its best asset. It pushes warm air in this cold temperature, by the way, it's 32 degrees today, pushes the warm air that comes out of this radiator up through here and towards my legs, keeps my lower body warm once the bike warms up. You can actually feel that difference. All right, the Go Wing does come with a sound system. Um, it's okay, you know, every bike sound system to me is kind of just okay. Um, and I'm fine with that because I really don't ride with my music blaring out for everybody to hear. I, nobody wants to hear that stuff. So I usually have the music playing in my helmet through my Apple CarPlay or whatever. Um, but it does have two front speakers and two rear speakers back here by the passenger seat. And I have turned it on and it sounds, it sounds okay. I mean, you can hear your music. Uh, it's, it, it does its job. All right, guys, let's talk about this dashboard for a second. Uh, space shuttle dashboard, love this dashboard. Great looking dashboard. I love the layout of this dashboard. You got the uh, central LCD screen there in the middle. You've got some analog speedometer, analog tachometer over there. You got some informational panel over here that is right now giving me the air temperature, the number of miles I've ridden, and uh, the range to empty along with my gas gauge. You can see I have less than uh, half a tank there. I've never had a gas gauge on a, on a bike. It's so nice to have that gas gauge. Now you can use the center console buttons here to switch between things uh, here. You can see that little arrow. As I hit the select button, that little arrow moves from one of the three positions over here. So you can go from air temperature here, showing air temperature, to showing your cruise control speed. Um, I usually keep it on air temperature. That's great. I had, a, I had a temperature gauge just on my handlebars of the VTX. Now it's integrated into this dashboard. Really love it. Down here, you can go from total miles traveled to your trip A and your trip B and back to total miles. I leave it on total miles. And then down here for range, it tells me how many miles I can go on the gas that I have left. I haven't tested that. I don't think I will. Anyway, it's good to know. And if I hit the select button here, uh, it changes to the tire pressure monitoring system, gives me information about the front tire. That little indicator says FR for front. And then I hit it again, it says RR for rear tire. Now it's not showing any pressure there because you, you gotta be moving 16 miles an hour or faster for it to kick in and show here. If it's just static, it's not gonna show. But like I said, I leave it on range to empty. Really love that. Over on this side, you've got uh, an indicator that shows it's in neutral right now. You've got hill climb assist lit up there. You've got the different modes there. Like I said, you can go from econ mode to rain mode to tour mode to sport mode. And I normally ride it in tour mode and you can see it's in neutral there. Uh, when you put it in drive, that end becomes a D. Pretty cool stuff. ABS brakes, says my parking brake is on there and it shows that my fog lights are turned on, that green symbol there. Um, down here, this informational panel gives me the temperature of the engine. It tells me my center stand is down. It'll also tell me if my side bags are open or my trunk is open. It'll tell me that. It'll tell me what uh, ride configuration I have it in. Right now, I just have it in single rider, but you can change that to single rider with luggage. You can change it to double rider. You can change it to double rider with luggage and that automatically adjusts the rebounds and the shock of the bike. Uh, so it gives you uh, the kind of ride you expect for the kind of uh, weight and passenger count you're carrying. Above that is the heated grips and heated seats. My gosh, this has five settings there's buttons on the center panel where you can change that. You can see it's moving now for the heated grips. 
got all five on and I can just dial it down. I'm telling you, three is plenty. Five gets really, really hot. Same thing for the seat. This is the front seat, the driver's seat, and you can adjust it anywhere from one to five or off like that. And a whole slew of just warning lights up there that will illuminate when necessary. You've got your turn signal indicators. And by the way, these turn signals are auto canceling. It's got a gyroscope somewhere in it. When you complete the turn, a few seconds later, it will turn the turn signals off for you. This old man really loves that. Now, one thing I will tell you, this home screen uh, defaults to this when you're not connected to your helmet or your Apple CarPlay. But this really could be uh, done better, I believe. It's adequate, it does its job, it's nice. Um, you can go press the home button. You see you got your main options here, audio source, your navigation. You can connect to your phone. The vehicle settings, that's where you change those uh, ri that ride configuration we were talking about earlier. And then the audio settings. Uh, navigation, uh, it's okay. It's just a little busy. Uh, the, the, all of the letters are lined in white, makes it a little more difficult to read, to be honest with you. And every road seems to be, if it's of any size, some sort of dual lane uh, display here rather than a single lane display. So, you know, it's okay. It's adequate. I use Waze through Apple CarPlay. I don't use this. But you know, this could be done better. One color, or two colors, I think you can change the color to a tan background instead of this gray background. That doesn't help much uh, from a visibility standpoint. It's bright enough, don't get me wrong, you can see it, but it's just something about the layout. It, it it's just could be better designed in my opinion, and I know a lot of people feel the same out there that own this bike. Also, this bike comes with cruise control. So when you turn cruise control on, you see that little yellow light turning off and on. That on means it's activated and ready to set. And then there's another button on the handle. When you're up to speed, you just hit that and it sets. When I first started using the cruise control, uh, I found it difficult to, like it wouldn't stay on cruise control. And I realized that my foot was accidentally hitting the the brake over here because there's not a long throw on this brake arm. So my foot was on this foot rest and my toe was touching that brake pedal and when you engage the brake of course it disengages the cruise control. Once I figured out I was doing that I've never had another problem with cruise control engaging and staying engaged. Now because this bike is a DCT meaning there is no clutch You'll notice down here there's no clutch lever. It changes gears automatically for you smoothly. Um, the only downside to that is I think when it downshifts, you've got to be ready for that. It, it upshifts and downshifts on its own. You're not necessarily controlling that, although you can. There's a manual mode and there's paddle shifters. Even in automatic mode, you can use the paddle shifters, and so you have some control. But that downshifting in turns can surprise you, so you've got to be a little bit careful with that, especially in slow maneuvering situations where you're going from like second gear to first gear. Um, it can it can catch you off guard, so but you get used to it pretty quick. Anyway, because it's a DCT and has a clutch, and I'm sorry, does not have a clutch, it stays in neutral when the bike is off. Therefore, there's a parking brake because if you don't set the parking brake, the bike will roll. It is in neutral. So on a hill like this uh, driveway of mine, it would roll back if I didn't set the parking brake. Let me show you that. Right there on the side is the parking brake lever, and you just lift it up and it locks in place. And if you pull it up and let it go, it will release. Now the problem I have with the parking brake is it seems to be pretty loose from the factory. I've adjusted it once, but it tends to loosen up over time. I, I need to adjust this one more time. It's not difficult to adjust, but it seems to need adjusting more than I care. It does do an adequate job. When that thing's engaged, the bike is not moving. That gives me some comfort. Okay, as we continue back on this bike, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is this glove box. It does not lock, number one. So it's don't put anything in here and walk away from the bike that you want, you know, is valuable. You don't want to lose it. 
you push the button, and I'll tell you, that button's a little finicky. I have found, as others have found, that if you push this side of the button, it seems to open up much easier than if you push this side of the button. So you push that down, it raises up. I have, because I don't have Homelink installed, I have installed uh, a garage door opener with some Velcro right here underneath. So that's on the lid. I can control my garage door when I arrive home or leave. Um, inside the glove box, they have a connection to connect your cell phone and a little foam insert to put your cell phone in so it protects it while you're riding. Now I have the Carlin kit wireless dongle that connects to my cell phone. So I don't, I no longer connect my cell phone directly in here. Uh, one problem that people have talked about and I experienced too, when you connect your cell phone and put it in here and close it up, especially on these hot Texas days, your phone will get pretty hot. So that's a concern. Um, but anyway, this works for me. I've got space in here if I choose to use it for anything. Uh, I do from time to time uh, put a few things in here that are unique and special to the ride I'm going on. Uh, otherwise, there's really nothing in here but this Carlin kit uh, connector wireless dongle that I talked about. So functional little glove box does not lock. That's the only issue with it. All right, let's talk about this center console. It's where you start and stop the bike. Um, this dial will light up when you get close to it with your key fob, so the bike is ready to be turned on or whatever, turn the accessory on. So turning clockwise turns the accessory on and gets the bike ready to start. And then you just come over here and hit the start button and it purrs to life. Counterclockwise will shut the bike off. And then the bike also has a, a locking, a steering wheel lock. You can turn the wheel all the way to the left and then turn this dial one more time to the left and you'll hear a beep. That was the beep. Now the steering wheel is locked and nobody can push your bike away and then it unlocks when you turn it back clockwise. Okay, so the center stack. This is a main control knob for your navigation, your, your pane up here. You can scroll through many items just by turning this knob and then when you get to the one you want, you press enter and it's illuminated so you can see it at night. There is a home button that takes you home on the main screen a back button that will take you back. There is select and set. When you saw me toggling through those options on the information panels here, I was using the select and the set. Info button there, audio source. That will change from your, if you're listening to your music, from your helmet to the bike. That will change it. Here's the setting for the settings for the heated grips and the heated front seat. And then there's some blank settings here. You can add right here uh, a home link button. Uh, I wish it came with the bike, but you, it's an option. You can buy it, you can add it. It's a little bit difficult to add, but this can become a garage door opener uh, button for you. And then of course the on off switch for the fog lights is right here. All right, let's talk for a minute about the gas tank and the gas uh, filling process for this bike. It's very interesting. First of all, the gas tank is a 5.5 gallon gas tank. That's a little smaller than the previous generation Go Wing and draws a lot of cri uh, criticism, to be honest with you, on social media. Um, but with the efficiency of this new engine, you can get almost as far, I believe you can get as far on a 5.5 gallon tank as you could with the old larger tank and that operating system. So I got no issues with it. Man, this thing will go 250, 260 miles. I'm ready to get off the bike at that point and stretch my legs. So I got no issues with the size of the gas tank. But let's talk about how you get gas in this bike. All right. It relies, once again, on the key fob being close to the bike. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. The gas cap is under this panel right here. This panel is locked. You cannot get into it from right here. So here's how you do it. If you have the key fob close to the bike, there's another panel right over here, you can see, that has a push button right here. You push that button, this panel opens up, 
a uh, little cubby for storage in here. That's kind of nice, pretty small. Not sure what you're gonna keep in there, but right up here, there's a button that you push. And I'm gonna push it, and when I do, that pops open right there. And then you can get in here, take the gas cap off, fill it up, and you're good to go. You push it back down, it locks into place. You close this, and you're ready to go again. That's how you get gas in the bike. You walk away, that side panel is now locked. It will not open without the key fob being close to it. You know, I spoke a minute ago about the ability to manually shift this bike. It's over here on the left handlebars. You can see um, this plus sign right here on this gray lever that shifts up uh, the gears up on this side and then down on the other side. And you see that one with the negative sign on it shifts down. This is also where the walking mode is. This bike has a reverse. Can you believe that? A reverse. How handy is that? I use it so often to back out of slight inclines where otherwise I'd be pushing this 847 pound bike. You, I'll show you how it works here. Well, no, I won't. Once you have the bike on and you have it in neutral, you push this button. It engages the walking gear and then you can press this back button we'll walk it back very slowly so you can get out of a parking spot or you push this front this front lever and it will walk it forward uh, a little bit faster than walking it back because it feels like you have more it knows you have more control um, but still a reasonable speed for getting you out of a place if uh, walking it forward still on this left handlebar control module um, you have low beam, high beam right here. You can flash your high beams. You can hit that out and it permanently engages the high beams. You have the windshield uh, height adjuster here up and down. And then you have your volume controls for your music and your sound. And then while the bike is running, a lot of the buttons on the center console are disengaged and you must use the same sort of buttons here on the handlebars. You know, the theory being, if you're rolling, you want to keep your hands on the handlebars. So you've got a home button and a back button. You've got the horn button, which by the way, the horn on this thing, oh my gosh. Unbelievable. scare the crap out of some people. Uh, one thing about the horn button, it's kind of hard to find. You get used to where it is, but you know, at first I was pushing this turn signal cancel button thinking it was the horn button, um, but you got to lift your thumb up and I've got a little sticker on this uh, horn button that I bought from Traction Dynamics. It's supposed to glow in the dark, but in order for it to glow in the dark, it has to start in the light. So I noticed that's completely ineffective. Uh, don't waste your time buying the sticker. Anyway, it'd be nice if this horn button had a sort of a, a, a raised point on it or some sort of configuration like this home button where you can actually feel that it's different than one of these other buttons. If you could feel a difference with this button, it would be easier to find. And then again, similar to this rotating dial where you press enter, you've got your little keypad here where you can rotate and then press enter in the center. And then to engage a phone call, answer a phone call, uh, bring up Siri or whatever, you press this button right here. I've also got the uh, quad lock wireless charging uh, pad right here. I hook my phone up to this and it charges the phone. It's connected to power, uh, tightly wrapped up and, and clean uh, installation here but it charges my phone without any wires and it has a vibration dampening system to it which protects the phone and keeps it from getting damaged due to vibration. I love this device. It takes away the need for, for wires. All right, now let's go over here and explore this handlebar and the controls on this handlebar. I have uh, my aftermarket Vantru dash cam installed right here. Um, this allows me to control the dash cam manually if I want. Otherwise, it automatically comes on and shuts off when I ride. No big deal. I have a RAM mount attached here where I put my GoPro when I'm doing some vlogging. Uh, this is the rear-facing GoPro, GoPro that uh, faces back towards me and captures me while I'm riding. Um, okay, here on the handle, we have the uh, 
cruise control engage button. We have the hazard light button. We have the resume and set and up and down speed for the cruise control right here. Okay, here we have the neutral drive and manual buttons. Um, if you want to run this bike in manual mode where you're doing all the shifting and the bike has nothing to do with it, you put it in manual mode. Otherwise, you have neutral and drive. And again, remember in drive, as I said, you can override the gears manually even though it's in drive. You have the start and the kill switch up here. Uh, you have the mode toggle uh, lever right here that will switch between that rain, econ, tour, and sport mode. And then you have the front brake. One thing I do want to talk about, guys, is the position of these handlebars. Uh, I'm a short guy, short arms. When I first got on this bike, it seemed like the handlebars were a little far in front, and I was sort of having to lean over a little bit when I rode. Um, I don't have the best back, so that was a concern for me. What I found on YouTube and I installed, and by the way, go check out the installation video if you're thinking about these, is these Healy bar risers. It's that little black piece in there. You take off the handlebar, you install that, you put the handlebar back on, and what that does is it moves those handlebars back towards you a little bit uh, for a more comfortable seating position, and of course it raises them a little bit as well. Um, so really like those. Chris Caliente, if you follow his channel, he put on some Healy bar handlebars completely replaces this handlebar that has a lot more uh, gives you a lot more maneuverability and, and a lot more adjustability when setting your riding angle for your handlebars but these Healy bar risers available online go check out my video work really well for me and now the handlebars in are, are in a great riding position very comfortable all right guys the next hot topic, almost as hot as the navigation system on this bike, is the seat, the stock seat from Honda. There are a lot of folks out there that don't really care for the stock seat. It's a unique sort of, I want to call it, it's not really suede, but it sure has a texture to it. It's not a leather texture or a vinyl texture. It is sort of a suede texture. texture. I, and it's got some a decorative like striping here and the stitching is, is, is a gray stitching. It's a beautiful seat to be honest with you. I really like the way it looks. Um, it is a little firm. Really like the looks of it and I haven't had any trouble with the comfort on it but I'll tell you I haven't taken it on a long long trip. I have been riding for almost a couple of hours and it does start to, you know, your butt starts to ache a little bit on this thing. Um, that's most people's complaint. There are a lot of folks that really just do not like this seat, but there's a lot of aftermarket options for you. Um, Russell Daylong is a popular one. Ultimate seats are popular. There's just a lot of different options for this. I know Chris Caliente just recently got him an ultimate seat, which you can get some color into it, some inlays, some leather inlays, you know, croc, ostrich, cool stuff. Anyway, you can really customize this seat. Um, what I also don't like about it, because I'm a short guy, you can see these scratches here. My boot will drag over this when I'm putting my foot leg over, and you cannot, once you scratch this, this doesn't come out. It permanently has damaged the side of this seat. And I've heard some folks talk about the stitching coming undone like right here in the corners mine hasn't but I've seen some some videos where people are uh, have that situation um, it looks pretty solid to me to be honest with you but this scarring is really sort of disappointing I imagine sometime in my future I will be getting probably an ultimate seat uh, and changing this out because like I said I do want to take this on a long maybe an interstate ride and a couple hours and I'm ready to get off this thing. So we want to change that. Over here is the heating uh, adjustment for the passenger. The passenger seat is also heated so they can change uh, how they want that heat setting from off to one, two, three, four, five, just like the front five settings. And I imagine it gets super toasty. I've never been on the back. 
I added this aftermark, aftermarket Utopia backrest. Uh, works well, but I'll tell you what the issue I have with the backrest. Yes, on a long, smooth highway, it's comfortable and gives you some support. But on city streets where there's a lot of sort of bouncing and uneven pavement, this backrest, it's pretty firm and it acts like a fulcrum. Um, and it's, you know, constantly pushing against you. And if you have back or neck issues on a bumpy uh, a street, you know, I, I, that thing just becomes more of an irritant than a help. On a long drive or you're on a freeway for a long time, that's going to be wonderful. So I'm considering just for everyday riding, taking that backrest off so that I have more flexibility to move as the bike moves underneath me rather than this being right up against my back and I don't have that uh, ability to absorb the, the shock like that. Anyway, love I love the design of this. It's easy to install. It's adjustable. It folds down so that your passenger can get on easily. It was a great ad. I just, uh, there's a use for it and I don't think everyday use is uh, the best use for it, so I may be taking it off soon. Passenger backrest, same material, same uh, decorative stitching. Um, I, I, I don't know if the heated element, I don't believe the heated element goes into the backrest here either. It's got a place to add some armrest. If you don't like the length of the armrest, you can add some aftermarket armrest here. But it's pretty comfortable. My wife's been on it a time or two. She says it's much, obviously much more comfortable than what I had with the VTX. And the passenger handles, you know, in the 2018 models, these were very close to the seat and hard to get a grip on. Everybody complained. Honda listened and moved these handles out a little bit. Much easier to hold. Very, very sturdy handles here. All right, checking the oil is also an interesting concept on this bike. Uh, I think Honda recommends that it be on a level surface, that it be straight up, not on the side stand, not on the center stand either, not on either one of those. Just straight up, which means you need to be sitting on the bike while you check the oil. That's a difficult call to get a proper, accurate reading from the dipstick. Oh, and let's talk about the dipstick for a minute. Way down here, the stock dip dipstick um, handle part is way down here. Now I have, oh, we're going to talk about this aftermarket one in a minute, but it's hard to get to and this engine is hot when you're checking it sometimes. So sometimes you can burn your fingers trying to unscrew the stock cap on the dipstick and get it out. I have purchased the Traction Dynamics dipstick extender, which is a cool little device, brings it way up higher so that you can get your gloves or your fingers on it, no problem and just unscrew it and then of course that comes out just like that and there's your dipstick. So you guys check out Traction Dynamics dipstick uh, cap extender. Very handy, easy, easy to install, reasonably priced. Go check it out, Traction Dynamics. You know I love these chrome pipes. These chrome pipes are double lined all the way up here to the front of the engine uh, what that does is the outer layer doesn't get blue or discolored from the heat. Uh, so you always will maintain these beautiful chrome pipes. Um, the foot pegs, they come with these standard, the bike comes with these standard Honda foot pegs. Um, I've, on the VTX I had foot boards, running boards, so I was really looking for some, something a little thicker and wider than that to get my foot on and I found these easy to install Gold Strike I believe, Gold Strike uh, foot pegs that just fit right where the factory peg was and again here on the left side of the bike the same sort of Gold Strike uh, floorboards. They could stand to be a little bigger but they're plenty for me so um, that works. The side stand uh, strong, sturdy, works well. I added an aftermarket, again from Traction Dynamics, sort of foot pad that screws on to the base here, making a wider footprint for soft parking lots or in the summer when it's asphalt and the asphalt's kind of warm. Gives us more of a footprint uh, and makes it more sturdy. 
The center stand, also very good, very strong. I've added this rough surface uh, piece, uh, again from Traction Dynamics, sort of a sandpaper feel sticker that goes on this and helps you keep your foot on it when you're lifting it up. Let's talk about putting this on the center stand. The first time I went to put this bike on the center stand, it was so difficult. I had this overwhelming feeling that the bike was going to tip over that way. Um, and I could not get this thing, no matter how hard I tried, to pull up on its center stand. And I, you know, I ask everybody, finally, Max with Traction Dynamics, he has a video, go check this out. You got to get over the fear of this thing tipping over. You put your foot, you put your foot on this thing and step down on it and straighten the bike up and eventually you'll feel it even though you're pushing that way and you think it's going to fall over as long as you have your foot on this center stand and pressing down there will come a moment where it is anchored solid you won't it will not push any further that way <clears throat> and you will come to realize that both feet are on the ground it's not going to tip over and at that point it's very easy to grab these handles and pull it up on its center stand works very easy and let me tell you once you get the secret you'll never have trouble with it ever again so thank you max for creating that video calling me out on not knowing what to do and uh, but now i do and it works very well all right your passenger floorboards are really cool they fold up for this sleek look right here when you have a passenger you just fold them down Aren't those cool? Why couldn't they have done something better with the front driver foot pegs, floorboards? But these are cool. They look nice. They're functional. They're strong. They fold up out of place. Look cool when they're folded up. All right, let's talk about the trunk for a minute. I've added this aftermarket spoiler. It comes with an integrated turn signal, brake light, running light. Really love that. The 2018 models had a smaller trunk, and I think in 2021, they increase the size of this trunk. Again, it only works when the key fob is near the bike. When the key fob is near the bike, it will not open. The button is underneath. You see that right there? That opens, you just press that. It unlocks and opens the trunk. But it's a huge trunk, holds 20 pounds. That's its weight limit. It will hold two of these full-size helmets. You can see my showies in there. If I wanted to, I could put two helmets in there, but lots of space. I bought an aftermarket organizer uh, for the back wall there, and then a carpet pad for the bottom wall, and then some side organizers. Very handy, plenty of space. Love this. You can lock your stuff up and walk away, especially the helmet. You don't have to put the helmet on the side of your bike, which I had to do with the VTX all the time. Now I just keep it in there, it's safe and I can walk away. The saddlebags, same thing. They've got a button right up here that you push and they open up. They each can hold 20 pounds. That's their weight limit. I've added some saddlebag lid organizers. Uh, that video was out just a few days ago. Go look at that if you're curious about adding those. Plenty of space in there. And again, they only open up when the key fob is near. Little cable to keep it from going very far, shock absorber to keep it from just bouncing down. Um, and then I've got more of the uh, lid organizer there and plenty of space in there. Uh, I believe in there somewhere is a connection for, maybe it's in the other side. Yeah, I think it's in the other side. A USB connection similar to what's in that glove box up there. You can connect your phone. So that's the storage on this. Plenty, I think, for uh, you know a short trip. Uh, you can buy aftermarket luggage that will fit right up here in the passenger seat that will extend the, the capabilities of the storage. Uh, so plenty of storage in my mind on this bike. I know that All right, guys, that's about wrapping up my one-year review of this Honda Goldwing DCT Tour model. I love it. I can't believe I didn't make this purchase probably back in 2018 when this new body style first came out. I am so happy. I loved that VTX. Oh my gosh, that was a great bike. I don't miss it one bit. I absolutely love 
this gold wing, all the, the capabilities of it, it's everything I need. I would buy it again in a heartbeat and I can highly recommend it to you. If you're looking for a 2024 uh, gold wing, do it. If you're looking for a touring bike to take you long distances in ultimate comfort, I'm telling you this is the one for you. No complaints. Well, I say no complaints. There are some things they can do better. Let's go over that. Oh, and I also bought a small version. Isn't that cool? Not quite as fuel efficient. All right, I have a list so I don't miss anything. So you guys bear with me. But there are some things that this bike either could do better or really I feel needs to, when you put this kind of money down on a bike, needs to come with the bike. I mean, this is the flagship model for Honda. It ought to have some of these things. So let's talk about some of the cons on this bike and maybe some things that we would like to see in the future. Better nav screen and layout. I mean, look at Waze. If, if you want an example of what a good navigation system should look, out, look like, just go look at Waze. Luckily, I can use Apple CarPlay on this and I can kick up Waze and use Waze on this front screen. I love it. But Honda, take a cue. Uh, go design something that functions, waypoints, looks better. It definitely needs a better navigation system. And by the way, built-in wireless Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Most cars these days are starting to have that. No wires, automatically connects. Flagship bike Honda, put it in there. Factory provided home link. That thing I told you was so hard to install. It ought to come pre-installed from the factory. It takes them an extra 15 minutes to put it in in the factory when the bike's all apart before they put it all together. Include it, increase the price by $100. I don't care, put it in there. I mean, my garage door opener works well inside this lid, so I found a workaround. But again, flagship model, $30,000 motorcycle. Put a button on it. Larger foot on the side stand. I told you about that. I added the aftermarket bigger footprint. Just add a bigger footprint Honda from the factory. Backrest option. Honda does have, uh, there's a Honda version backrest you can buy. It's a small, smaller piece. Um, you know, I don't think gives as much support as this. I think they could improve the backrest on these bikes. Blind spot monitoring system. They make aftermarket blind spot monitoring systems. I have solved that issue with some cheap little stick on mirrors here um, that work well and I like them. Uh, but I would love to see an integrated blind spot, blind spot monitoring system on these bikes. Built-in front and rear dash cam. That might be asking a lot, <laughs> uh, Honda, but, and there are great, this one is great aftermarket options you can get, but I'd like to see it on the bike uh, straight from the factory, to be honest with you. A trunk mat, put a trunk mat in there. It's just plastic. When you get the, <laughs> when you get the, the bike and you open it up, the trunk floor is just that, the plastic of, of the trunk itself. $30,000 bike, $12 carpet trunk mat. Put it in there, Honda. Better tip over prote protection. You know, I'm looking at the Traction Dynamics tip over protection. It's pretty expensive, but it's insurance, and I think uh, probably going to be well worth it. Honda, just make it better. I mean, you can clearly see if this thing tips over, it's going to hurt the saddlebags. Build something into the saddlebags um, so we don't need aftermarket. Sorry, Max. Uh, I'm glad you're doing it because they don't. But $30,000 bike, put better tip-over protection on the bikes. Factory belly pan. Do something with that engine. I cannot believe you hit one rock or one log or one two by four in the road and it breaks off a piece of that engine at the bottom and all the oil comes out and you've got a ruined engine and now you have to replace that engine to the tune of eleven, twelve thousand dollars on your already thirty thousand dollar bike. Honda, protect that engine. Do something to protect that engine. Put a factory belly pan on there. And last, adaptive cruise control. 
the technology's out there. I know some bikes have it already. Let's put adaptive cruise control on these bikes. Guys, I want to thank you for your time today. Uh, I'm sorry it ran long, but there's a lot to talk about here. I encourage you to go look at the spike. If you're in the market for a touring motorcycle, I think you'll love it. I appreciate each and every one of you for following my channel. And I am so excited for 2024 and what it brings. We're going to have a lot of fun, channel. Thank you for watching. And until we talk again, ride safe and God bless.